Now we've talked about these contracts and how to produce them, and a lot of times HTTP or direct HTTP requests is a better way to go than those RPC mechanisms. But let's talk about this uh, retry that clients must do. Clients must retry failed network operations, and so you must have code in your client side in order to do this. The client code has to retry the operations due to the network fallacies, again, that we talked about earlier, timeout, topology changes. Also, you should avoid sticky sessions, by the way. Uh, let me talk, go into that for another moment. Sometimes clients make a request and they have a particular server that they're talking to, and then they would like future client requests to go to that same server. Um, that sounds nice, but in this world where failure can happen at any time, we call that a sticky session, by the way, but in this world where failure can happen at any time, it's not a good model to have because that server could go down at any time and then the next client request that comes in might be sent to a completely different server. So when you're architecting your application, you really want to try to avoid using sticky sessions as part of your application because they really just can't be guaranteed in a scenario where failure is inevitable. Um, clients must retry operations because of server throttling. If too many clients are making a request into a server, the server might report that it's busy, and then a client really should back off a little bit of time and then make a request again, right? You want to back off to give the server some time to catch up to handle the requests that are coming into it, and then the client can make another request to have the server do some additional processing. You don't want to immediately retry if the service says it's unavailable or if it's returning an error. I mean, if it returns an actual error, then retrying should just regenerate the same error over and over again. There's no value in doing that. So this means you need to look exactly or specifically at the kinds of errors you're getting back from making a server request, and you have to intelligently retry some of them and intelligently not retry some of the other ones. Never assume that a dependent service is already up and running. Now, it's true in this world where we're going to have multiple instances running. You do your best to make sure that at least one instance is, or the orchestrator, it does its best to make sure that at least one instance is up and running. And so you can usually count on that dependent service is there. But there's also a chance that for some reason that service completely goes down, it would be good to be able to compensate for that in your code and not just keep hammering on service that just doesn't exist. You want to prevent distributed denial of service attacks against yourself. I've already talked about this earlier and we discussed circuit breakers. I put a link here to a website where you can learn more about them, but it's a very popular pattern. You can find lots of information about it on the internet. Another thing that you want to consider using is exponential backoff, where your client makes a request to the server, the server for whatever reason says no, and instead of just immediately retrying, you might wait a little bit and then go and try. If the server says no again, now you might want to wait longer before you retry again. And you have this exponential back off that occurs up to some maximum amount of time before you go and try to hit the server again. Um, this again just makes it so you're not just pounding on the server with a lot of requests and bombarding it. Um, now for clients to do retry of operations, there is this assumption that the client is making, which is that the server handles these requests in an idempotent fashion. Let's talk about that. Services must implement their operations idempotently. An idempotent operation can be performed two or more times with no ill effect. That's the definition of what it means to be an idempotent operation. It can be performed multiple times with no ill effect. Now, some methods that take some input, do some processing, and return some output, they are just naturally idempotent. So I give an example here where, let's say I take a, a picture, an image, I upload it to some server, so the image is the input, the server does some processing, let's say it makes a thumbnail of the image, and the output is the thumbnail image itself. If I retry that operation and I send the same exact image up to the server, it will create the same thumbnail image and return the same output back to me. That is naturally idempotent. I can send the, send the same image multiple times to the server. It does the same exact processing, sends me the same exact output every single time, and no ill effect is happening on the server.
So that's, again, naturally item potent. Another example would be a calculator app. The client sends 2 plus 3 up to the server, the server returns back 5. If the client sends 2 plus 3, the server sends back 5 again. It is just naturally item potent operation. But methods that have side effects are not naturally item potent. And these require that you, as the developer of the server, do some additional work to guarantee the item potency. An example of an operation that is not naturally item potent would be repeatedly adding $100 to a specific bank account. So if a bank account has $0 in it, and then I send an operation to add $100 to the account, the server is going to add $100. But if I get, let's say, a timeout because I'm waiting for the server to reply, but it seems to be taking too long, my client might retry that operation and tell the server to add $100 again. If the server just does that blindly, it's now going to add another $100 to the account and it has $200 in it. That causes state corruption and we don't want that to happen. So the server has to do something in order to guarantee item potency here and make sure that this adding $100 is item potent and has no ill effect. Um, and I'll talk more about what it can do uh, on the next slide. So I wanted to put here in bold letters at the bottom. What we want is exactly one semantics. We want the client to send a message to the server and for that message to be received and processed exactly once. But in this world of failure, the way that we get exactly one semantics is that the client does retries and the server makes the operation item potent. Right? And that's how we implement the exactly one semantics. Client does retries, server makes the operation item potent, and that's how we get exactly one semantics in a world where failure is inev inevitable at any time. Let's talk about item potent CRUD operations now. CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete, and these are the four most common operations that are done to any kind of piece of data that you have, right? like a bank account. I can create a bank account, I can read the balance of the bank account, I can update the bank account, I can delete the bank account. Okay, so for the create, you're, what you're effectively trying to do is you're trying to call a create method. The way that you'll typically do that is by performing an HTTP POST operation against a server. And then the create operation goes and returns an ID. The POST verb of HTTP is not defined to be item potent. That is, HTTP, the specification, says there are certain verbs that you, the implementer of these HTTP operations, you must make them be item potent. The HTTP spec says that POST itself does not have to be item potent. But you might want to make it item potent anyway. And there is a pattern that you could use to do that, which I will talk about at the bottom of this slide. So let's just postpone that for a moment and I'll get back to it. Let's look at a read operation. A read operation is where the client performs a read against some ID. Right? This might be the bank account number, for example. And then it's going to go and get some data back. Typically, we do this with an HTTP request using a verb of get, head, options, or trace. Now, these verbs are naturally item potent. If I say to a bank account, how much money is in you, and it returns me the number, if I say again, how much money is in you, because I retry, it should return the same number. So it's naturally item potent. Usually, there's nothing special you have to do here for a read operation. Let's look at an update operation. To do an update, the client performs an update operation, maybe against the ID, like a bank account, and then the data of what you want the operation to become. So here, we're not saying add $100. Here, we're saying more like, I want to update the bank account so that it has this amount of money in it. Right? So not add to what's already there, but make the balance be this value. This is usually done with an HTTP verb request. Now, usually for HTTP verbs, or a put verb rather, it's last writer wins. So if multiple clients are doing puts, or if you do a retry, do a put in a retry loop, you're ending up putting the same piece of data there multiple times. And so in effect, it's item potent. You're saying, I want the balance to be 100, I want the balance to be 100, I want the balance to be 100. If you do that in a retry loop multiple times, the end result of all of those is the balance is 100. 
and then delete. Well, you can say delete with an ID. Usually we do that with an HTTP verb of delete. Now the first time you call this, it's going to delete the ID. If you put this in a retry loop and you try it again, then the server is usually going to reply with, that thing doesn't exist because you deleted it the first time, so now it doesn't exist. So the way to make this okay on the client side is if you execute a delete operation and the server says it's already gone, then don't treat that as an error. Treat that as, okay, then great, I did the delete. Even though the delete was done earlier, you just treat it as I did the delete, and then you just move on as if everything is okay. So HTTP, as I said, the specification, it requires that most verbs be implemented in an idempotent way. But POST is not one of those verbs, and POST is frequently used for create operations. So instead, you can take something that's not idempotent and make it become idempotent using what I refer to here as this idempotency pattern. Let me walk through that pattern with you. So first, the client is going to ask the server to create a unique ID. So it makes a request to a server and says, server, give me a unique ID. This could be a GUID or just some value that's meaningful to the server. It just has to be unique is the important part. Um, now, you could put this in a retry loop, and if you do, then the server is going to return new unique IDs each time. But the last one is the one you care about. The earlier IDs that you got back, you can just throw those away. If the client is a trusted client, then the client can create the ID themselves. So in other words, if you have clients that are talking to a server, but the server knows that the clients are going to create unique IDs, right, because maybe they're creating new GUIDs, right? Somehow the server can trust that the client or clients are creating unique IDs, then you could avoid a network hop by having the clients just create the IDs rather than going to the server to construct an ID. Now, once we have a unique ID, step number two is that the client is going to send the ID up to the server with the desired operation, like add $100 to a bank account, right? Somehow that information is encapsulated in the payload and sent up to the server. And this operation can, of course, be retried, uh, just like creating the ID could be retried too. Now, what the server is going to do when it receives this request is it's going to look up the unique ID in some kind of log. And if the ID is not in the log, then the server will perform the operation. So it says, okay, I've been told I'm supposed to add $100 to this bank account, and here's the unique ID that identifies this operation I'm supposed to perform. Let me look in this log and see if I've ever performed this ID operation before. And if it hasn't, it says fine, then I will perform it, and it will add $100 to the bank account. Then it will go and log the ID. So if another request comes in for the same ID, it was done, and so it just won't do it again. And in either case, um, it will return, the server will return OK, saying I did it or I did it earlier. It's still an OK operation to kind of indicate that it was done. You'll notice I have a note here on the right that says must be transacted. This is very important to understand. Looking up the ID in the log, doing the operation, and logging the ID, that has to be done as an atomic acid transaction. If it is not done that way, then you could look up the ID in the log and start doing the operation. While you're doing it, and before you've logged the ID, the client could retry. You look it up in the log, and it's not there yet. And therefore, you do the operation twice. That's not what you want. Now you've broken the item potency of this operation. So you cannot do it that way. These three things have to be done in a transacted way. And then you might say, well, if it's not in the log, let me go log it first, and then I'll do the operation. That also doesn't work, because it's not in the log, you log it, and then you crash. So now you never did the operation but you think you did because you logged it. So if the client retries, now you'll say, well, it's in the log, and so I did it, but really you didn't do it. So these three things have to be done as a transacted atomic unit, and that's very important that you do that. Now these logs of these IDs will grow without bounds over time, and that's not ideal either. 
So my last bullet here is, on the server side, you want to periodically delete old logs to avoid this unbounded growth. Otherwise, you're paying for the storage of these logs and maintenance of these logs, and you want to try to keep them as small as possible. Uh, so that's basically the pattern for how you can make a non-idempotent operation become idempotent.